Ця зустріч відбулася англійською мовою. Наш запрошений лектор – дослідник в галузі нейрофізіології Анджело Тедолді, який здобув пігажді в Лондоні, працював у різних країнах і, окрім нейрофізіології, викладає і популяризує науку. So look, in your announcement, you wrote that glial cells even can influence the behavior of people, yeah? It's, I don't know, maybe it's somehow very general formulation, yeah? But it's something that provokes interest. And also we read that some types of glial cells also can regenerate neural tissues, yeah? Yes. Yes, so the, these are questions which are interesting, for example, for me. If somebody yes. else is uh, wants to uh, like uh, say what what is interesting, uh, you are welcome also. And then I pass you Angela the word, and we are ready to listen to you. Perfect. Now let me share my screen. Okay. So what I'm gonna do, as I said, I'm gonna um let me close this. Oh, it's gone up there. It's okay. I'm gonna um just start briefly um. And the, the idea of what I wanted you to think about, um, as you're saying, Lesia, is that to think about whether we can actually define astrocytes as passive players in brain physiology. And I'll, go, I'll get to that one later on, but that was always the notion or, or the, the dogma, let's say, until pretty much the 70s. Um, just before we jump in, the only thing that I wanted to sort of um, explain, let me get a laser here, okay, explain was that um, what I used to do at, U, at, at the university or my research. So what I pretty much used to do, as you can see, we've got different types of neurons. We've got a couple of, um, of glial cells here as well. This is culture neurons. So it means that we collect the neurons from uh, rat brains and then we can culture them in a solution on a, on a glass, literally, um, for up to four to five weeks. And part of my project was to do um, electrophysiology. And electrophysiology is the branch of physiology that looks at how cells communicate to each other. And one interesting thing about neurons, as you probably um, learned from your previous lectures, is that they can have action potentials and they can actually um, share information from one to another by neurotransmitters. And pretty much what um, that is me with this very thin glass electrode that you can touch the neuron that you're interested in. And when you do, you're pretty much listening, as you can see here, you're listening to the chats or the, or the sort of talks that is going on between these different two neurons. And then you can look into the specific patterns of these types of deflections, if you want to call them that way. And the deflections give you an idea of whether these cells are trying to excite each other. So if they're trying to, um, you know, they're trying to actually, um, interact with each other or they're trying to inhibit each other so they're trying to reduce the type of excitability or the activations of these cells so this is done at the level of the cell culture but you can also do this in slides so you can have a brain slice here so there's an example of different types of recordings and and i put this slide here because what i like about this is you can see how different brain areas have different patterns of action potential. So you've got your pyramidal cells here in the cortex, they've got these very nice and, and defined patterns. You've got these other cells here, which is a burst firing. You've got the cerebellum here, the cells, the Purkinje cells, they've got this very weird and peculiar way of firing. And all of these differences were once thought to be mainly due to the different types of neurons. And it is indeed due to different, different types of neurons, but we also know now that these different types of firings are to do or link to the interaction with some of the glial cells present in different brain regions. So this was just my sort of background of what I used to do. But now let's start about, you know, talking about why we're here tonight. So the peculiar thing about astrocytes, so the, the term astrocytes, which is one of the, the glial cells that most the, the biggest um, um, in numbers present in the brain of glial cells, they were called by dead by Cajal himself because when he observed them around 1897, as you can see from his drawings here, he drew these very star-like cells. And because of the center of the cell and all these processes that you can see out here, he decided to define them as astrocytes or cell looking like stars. And, and for almost 100 years and more, because from 1897 to up to the 70s and 80s, 
these cells, astrocytes and a majority of glial cells were defined as glue. So the idea or the dogma was that these were cells that were present within the brain that weren't doing nothing. The only thing they were doing, they were supporting all the neurons, they were supporting our brain, and they were pretty much just um, as there to support everything. But they were not part of the, the thought process, they were not part of nothing. And, and it was interesting because this was a very sort of neurocentric view, as I like to call it. So what I mean by neurocentric is that the idea was that this is a human brain. If we look in this is specific in the cortex here, you might have some neurons interacting. And the idea was that there was an actual potential in your presynaptic neurons, so the neurons present on the pre part of the other neurons. And then this sort of action potential would activate synapses and then memory was formed. So this was a neurocentric view because the idea was, okay, we only have neurons. Neurons are only responsible. We don't care about anything else. That's what's happening. However, we now know, and this is my attempt of drawing an astrocytes, but I've got nicer drawings later. And um, we now know that actually astrocytes are part of the synapses. They can sense the interaction between neurons. They can sense what's happening. And not only that, they can also react and affect how these neurons can interact with each other. And this is very interesting because they said for, you know, for, for literally for almost 100 years, they, they were thought to be just glue or just sitting there doing nothing pretty much. But what do the numbers say? Because this is what people sometimes don't think about. They think about neurons, they don't think so much about glial, glial cells. Now there are roughly 83 billion neurons and we're looking at between 100 to 1,000 trillion synapses or connection with the human brain. And then for the glial cells, we actually have different numbers, but we have roughly between 16 to 65 billion glial cells in our brain. So, and the, the question that I want to put forward here for us to think about tonight, can we really just consider them glue? I mean, we have 83 billion neurons, lots of them, but we also have 16 to 65 billion glial cells or different type of glial cells. So it's difficult as a physiologist, and this, this was uh, my background, it's difficult to imagine that you have 65 billion cells present in our brain that are just sitting there doing nothing. And the reality, as I said, is way more complex. Now, there are different types of glial cells. We have astrocytes, we have microglia and oligodendrocytes, and we find these three mainly in the CNS, in the central nervous system. And then we have Schwann cells in the PNS. Now, I'm not gonna go into details of all of them. The two that I'm gonna be talking about mainly is gonna be astrocytes, and, and I'll explain later on why. And I'm gonna touch briefly on microglia as well, because it's the, the section, I guess, um, or the newest part of, of what we're trying to understand how they interact with neurons. Oligodendrocyte and Schwann cells are very important for the regeneration, and we can have a chat perhaps at the end because I didn't sort of put that together, but they're playing a big role in regeneration and how to repair the system that is actually not functioning properly anymore. So this is, um, with these cartoons, is a sort of a, the two or three branches, as you say, because there's a third one here that I like to talk about. Now, astrocytes are very important for axon guidance. What I mean about axon guidance is that when we are um, developing our brains and we are in our mother's wombs, um, what's happening is the neurons need to find a way to connect from where they are to their target, because we have certain neurons that have very long axons, very long dendrites, and they need to know where to get to and also when to stop. Now, for a long time, it's been started. For a long time, we knew there were some sort of proteins or something that was released in our brain to attract these neurons. And we now know that, that the astrocytes in particular are very important for this guidance because with the proteins that they actually have present on the membranes, for what they release, they can deter determine the target or the final target of certain neurons. So they can help them to actually get to the right spot. For the, for the microglia, the interesting thing is something that is known as synaptic pruning. And we'll see a bit about this a bit later on, but what it is pretty much, as, as you probably know, neurons have lots of spines, lots of these very tiny things that are rich in receptors and channels that are important for the neuro, neuron transmission and for neurotransmitter release. And what has been shown now, and I've got a nice video at the end, is that glia can actually remove some of these 
synapses present on the neurons, meaning they can actually change the way that neurons interact with each other. They can change the way that neurons can be excited or inhibited. So they're not, again, just passive and sitting there. They're actually interacting. But the one that I'm going to focus most of my talk on is around neuron astrocytes and how they sort of talk to each other to make sure that we can function as human beings or mammals in general. So if we look at an example here, what we know now is that, as I said earlier, we have our presynaptic neurons and a postsynaptic neuron. Now we have an action potential starting from our soma. It travels down the axon, it gets to the end, and at the end there is a release of neurotransmitters, and these neurotransmitters then is sensed or detected by your postsynaptic neurons, as you can see here, okay? So this is the presynaptic side or the neurons that you start with and the postsynaptic neuron or the neurons after the synapses. Now, astrocytes have all these processes that are known as PAP, the perisynaptic astrocytic processes. And these are very close, as you can see here, to the different connections that we have between the pre and postsynaptic neurons. And they're there, sitting there waiting or trying to wait to get some sort of neurotransmitters because when an action potential comes along and you have the release of neurotransmitters, these neurotransmitters sometimes can actually leave the synaptic cleft. And this liver synapses, they interact them with the pap so that they, they, your astrocyte can sense or can actually say, okay, something is happening. There is some action happening between these two neurons I need to be aware that there are some changes in our interaction, and it means that I have to be ready for what is coming next. It is a very simplistic way, of course, but it's just to give an idea. And these, as you can see, are these PAPs or processes are linked to this extensive branching, extensive number of, as you can see here, branches coming off. So you've got this small soma in the middle, which sometimes is almost impossible to see because it becomes part of all these different branches. And they then interact with lots of different neurons. We've got another example here. So the red cells that you see here, those are neurons or the sum of neurons and all the green ones that you see are actually um, astrocytes interacting. So they can actually interact with lots of different synapses to sense what's happening. But how do they do this? And this was pretty much what was the new dogma, as I said, going from the 80s and then the 90s in talking about the tripartite synapses. So we're not having anymore just the pre and post synaptic neuron. We, are, we now know that there are three different parts to the synapses. We have the pre synapse, the post synapse, and then we have our astrocytes there. Now, one thing that I want to mention here, and I'm, I'm gonna look at it a bit later on, Neuro, um, neurons communicate with each other using neurotransmitters and neurotransmitters have different impact and different effects on the postsynaptic and presynaptic neurons. When it comes to astrocytes, the majority of their signaling, so the majority of the ways for them to communicate within the cell and with each other comes from calcium. So calcium, there is an increase in calcium present in the cytoplasm of these cells, of these astrocytes, and the increase in calcium activates cascades and activates different things that can get them involved and interacted in our synaptic plasticity. And this is an example. Um, I, I've, I've written all the review and I've got a review at the, at the end because um, the references already, because there are lots of very nice papers that cover all the action. You might want to go back and read them. But this is to give an example. So now here we've got a normal presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron. We've got our NMDA receptors, our AMPA receptors. Just, just to remind you that NMDA receptors are extremely important for memory formations. Those are the ones that allow calcium to flow into the cell and activate cascades downside that can activate memory formation. And as you can see in a normal situation, you've got your astrocyte sitting here just sensing. Now imagine there is a constant action potential activation on the presynaptic side, which means that lots of this neurotransmitter is then released, which means that it can actually spill over. That's the name of it, which means that it leaves the synaptic cleft here and it starts acting with some extra synaptic receptors, as you can see here, but also with this pap. Now this pap can sense this thing and what they actually do they move around trying to sense these changes in in neurotransmitter release and they as you can see they can extend themselves and become bigger around a synapses and this if you think about that it sort of makes sense because the idea is that 
one, once there is an activation and memory formation, as I said, because our NMDA receptors are activated, you want to make sure that you stabilize these synapses here so that it doesn't get lost or it doesn't get destroyed. And by activating and in engaging your astrocytes, you can actually protect the synapse and also help the synapse become stronger when it comes to memory formation. And the same thing you can see here, we've got the release of neurotransmitters. Now our um, astrocytes is involved and this involvement becomes bigger. Now the extra level of this here, as you can see, is that the astrocyte is now releasing this area. Now this area is a core agonist that is extremely important for the activation of MDA receptors. So NMDA receptors can only open if you have glutamate present, which binds to one side of the NMDA receptors, but you also need this area to co-activate the receptors. So when you have both of these, then your NMDA receptor opens and calcium can flow in. So now you can see how your astrocytes, they understand, so let's assume this is the first step when the connection is formed. They now realize that there is lots of speed over. They realize that there are these two neurons want to talk to each other. They are talking to each other. So a memory wants to be formed. So they start releasing this area and they get bigger. So they can again stabilize and make sure that the memory formation happens even in a stronger way. So this is the first example, just by the movement, just by this showing you that astrocytes are not just glue. They are definitely part of our synapses and definitely part of our memory formation. Angela, may I ask you? Yes, sure. and and does this pop have uh, has also some mechanical um, like role, uh, like fixing the synapse, or is it only like chemical uh, protection? And um, for when you talk about astrocytes, is mainly chemical, so they don't actually do, or at least not so far, they haven't been shown to affect synapses in that way. But for microglia is different. So microglia will actually go and physically remove the spines and the synapses if they think they're not working anymore. So some of the theory behind it is that the astrocyte is talking to the synapses, but the astrocyte is also talking to the microglia. And when this is happening, this is a way for the astrocyte to say, microglia, step back, we don't need you anymore. On the other hand, if you keep staying at this level here, when there is no much synaptic plasticity or activation, the astrocyte might not be involved and therefore the microglia might come in and remove it. Mm -hmm. I Do just see it? in this picture, maybe uh, it's just a picture that the astrocyte like embraces the synapse, yeah? And that's yeah. why I thought maybe there is also this mechanical like fixation. I mean, it could it could definitely be that there because I mean, imagine this becomes bigger in a way that it wants to cover or protect, as you said, this synapse, but also because it wants to make sure that if there are changes in the activity, it can detect it even faster and bigger. Because of course, if you're at this level of your closer here, when you're closer, you'll be able to detect smaller changes that perhaps you might be missing here. Because this is a way of seeing as one spine is established, when the memory is formed, so that when you have to recall the memory, it's easier versus something that is just being formed or in, in the process of being formed. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Yeah, okay. So as I was saying earlier, calcium, as you can see here, these are all different papers, all different studies in lots of different brain areas where they looked at, at astrocytes Every single one of these uh, neurotransmitters, so every single one of these receptors, because there are some receptors, even pH, have been shown to activate astrocytes and increase the calcium. So by increasing the calcium, you get the release of all of this thing here. So imagine that you've got glutamate, ATP, acetylcholine, and cannabinoid receptor, pH, or TRIP1 receptors. These are receptors that are involved with temperature, GABA, which is an inhibitory receptor. All of these activate calcium, and then they induce the release of all of these different um, neurotransmitters. So some of them have actually been shown to release glutamate itself, which means if you think about how synapses work, if it's sensing a change in glutamate and then it releases glutamate, it's almost helping the synapse to become stronger. ATP is released, again, very important for some of the pronergic receptors. Um, um, this urine, as I said, for the NMDA. So this increase in calcium that is due to the activation of receptors and channels present on our astrocytes 
allows them to release things. So again, showing that this is not just the passive part, but they can actively detect changes, change the intracellular calcium level and release to respond. And here I've got another video later on, but here what you can see is an example of an in vivo study done with a cover sleep. And um, this is a, is a, a mouse brain. So the mouse is actually sitting on a ball on a two photon microscope. You put a cover sleep, but you can put a recording um, electrode in there. And when you actually stimulate the area, as you can see here, you can actually detect the activation. And here is seen, you see the calcium activation or different types of um, astrocytes. Now, calcium activation is present in neurons as well, but when you do something like this, you don't actually see a huge increase of calcium in neurons as much as you see in astrocytes, simply because for neurons, calcium is very important, but they actually have a very good system to keep the calcium levels very low, because if the calcium levels get too high, the neurons eventually die. With astrocytes, it's very different. They can actually detect and they can sustain a higher amount of calcium because of the way that they are. They are different cells. They're glial cells. They're not neurons. And this is, again, it, I put it here because it's a nice, nice way to think about it. Now, so far, we've been talking about the single interaction of one astrocyte with the spine, right? So you've got the release of glutamate. You've got, so this is the release of glutamate, what you will see from having the electrode here, which is what I used to do. This is your calcium increase in your astrocytes. And then the astrocytes then releases something nearby on the single spine. And therefore your response is bigger, right? Because before you had only the glutamate, for instance, let's say the glutamate coming from the presynaptic neurons. Now you have that one plus the glutamate coming from your astrocyte. But the reality is that we also know that uh, if the interaction or the activation of this astrocyte is quite strong and the calcium response is even stronger, which might happen if you have a constant or one or two or three activation of the same spine close to the same astrocyte, the activation of the calcium can travel throughout the whole cell and then even affect another spine. So this spine here now is affected in a different way because you can see here what is affected is that you reduce the interaction between the two. Because remember, astrocytes and everything needs to be working on the homeostasis. So we have to make sure that the system doesn't go into override, but you can actually have the activation. If one side is extremely activated, you might want to reduce the activation on another side of the same neurons. And at the end, which is the calcium or global calcium response here, if you have more than one spines activating the same, the same astrocytes, the level of calcium that you reach in the cell will be probably the highest. And this will means that you're gonna activate lots of different spines, lots of different synapses, present lots of different neurons. And this figure that I put here, so look at this. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different neurons. These are all neurons. And this is your astrocyte. So as you can see, they're all connected and interacting with each other. Here is another example in the hippocampus. All of these with the sort of pinkish color, they're all astrocytes. And all of these cells here are neurons. So we've got all these paps that are moving around and trying to interact with different types of neurons. So it's normal to think about that this sort of simplistic way rarely happens, right? The single homosynaptic modulation. It can happen, but the reality is that we are more towards the territorial synaptic modulation so that they're actually interacting with different um, numbers of neurons so they can modulate the synaptic plasticity and the overall synaptic excitation of our brain areas. This is a nice video that I was telling about. So this is, again, people looking at the global impact. Because of, of what I was saying here that you've got the astrocytes interacting with different spines and different um, neurons, it makes sense that we have this global uh, way and this global interaction with different neurons. And on top of that, one of the things that um, astrocyte express on their membranes are gap junctions. Now, gap junctions allow neurons, uh, sorry, astrocytes to communicate with each other. And what a gap junction does is that it opens up almost like a hole or a pore in between two different cells and calcium can travel 
freely in between. So let's imagine looking at this figure here. Let's imagine that this cell here gets activated with calcium, but the activation is quite strong. This calcium might be transferred to this one. And if it's strong enough, it might go to this one, which means that the whole system can actually get activated. And I've got a video here. Let's see if it starts that actually shows this. There we go. So you see, then the animal is awake and asleep. When it's asleep, not much is happening. You see some of the activity, but the, the reality is that as soon as it wakes up, you see this global wave of activation of lots of different astrocytes. It should happen again now. There we go. Boom. So this activation you can see is like having a wave of calcium starting from this side and then moving towards that side. And this can happen only because astrocytes have these gap junctions and these gap junctions allow the calcium to move from one side to another, which means that if a small activation, as you can see here, happen here, the activation is actually traveling throughout the whole brain area as a wave so that all different cells can be activated. Why is this happening? We're not 100% sure. So there are lots of sort of theories, some experiments, and what they think is to do is to do the astrocytes can actually modulate the network and as, as um, you were saying to start with this, yeah, is almost a way to modulate our behavior. So let's assume example here, no astrocyte activation. You've got your normal background noise of the brain, different cells firing at different points. You've got these three neurons that might be firing together or not. These might be firing together. That's why they've got the same color. Now imagine that we've got a strong synaptic activation here because this is a brain area involved with memory formation in the hippocampus, for instance. Lots of activation. This activation recruits all the different astrocytes present here, which is shown up here. They've got the gap junction so they can all communicate. Now they're all activated. Now the system, becomes actually modulated and well more um, interactive. As you can see here, they're all now firing together. They're all together in the same sort of, um, on the same page and they're all doing something together, which is important for that memory formation. And this has been shown to actually be something that it can actually be pathological because in this example here, when we have normal gap junctions, um, astrocytes can detect the changes in our firing. And that's an example here. We've got our neuronal excitability and our synaptic transmission. And this is a normal situation, a wild type, nothing happens. Now imagine that you have some func or dysfunction in your gap junction. So the gap junction cannot talk to each other, or perhaps uh, there are some problems with our astrocytes. They cannot actually remove either glutamate or potassium from the extracellular um, matrix, which means that these neurons here are constantly active. That's why here you've got a lot of action potential and even a bigger response. Now you might ask me, well, what is the, I mean, we get it, Angelo here. This is the normal state. And this is a state where there are some problems with the system or the astrocytes, but what does that give you? Well, this is a normal state of animal behaving. This is an example of epilepsy, that there are some miscommunication between the astrocytes. This network cannot be formed and therefore this hyper excitability, because this is not a normal excitability, it's a hyper excitability, drives the system to the point that the animal doesn't function normally anymore. Now, this is an example with a disease, but this can also be the case, for instance, in Alzheimer. Now, in Alzheimer, we've been, there's been some studies showing that when you have A-beta plaques, the plaques themselves disrupts the communication between the astrocytes, which actually drives hyper excitability states that eventually brings to the inhibition of the of the system because of course the system is constantly in homeostasis and activating and deactivating to keep it stable so you see this is again another example how these cells astrocytes are not very passive now the last thing that i want to um to talk about as i said i don't want to spend too much time talking because I'd like to have some you know, questions from, from you guys, if you have questions, is the role of microglia. Now, as I said here, you see, imagine that we've got our presynaptic side, our postsynaptic sides, and we've got our pups here. The pups are interacting in different ways. Now, all the spines here, which you can see, this is, a, this is an actually a dendrite of a neuron with all the spines. And the microglia comes along and detects with different proteins 
the status of the spines. How active are the spines? Are the spines really necessary? Can we get rid of them? Are they actually part of the system or not? Now, if we think about the example that we had earlier, if this process is quite big and covers lots of the areas, it's gonna give it protection or the microglia is not gonna remove it. But if the pap is far away and does it actually interact with our pre and postsynaptic uh, neurons, what happens is this one here, there is a video. Okay, so this is our microglia, and these here are our spines. Do you see what happened here? So the microglia has just removed the spine and now it's traveling down. So I'm gonna play it again because maybe we didn't actually see that. So these are all spines. So imagine all this little, little thing up here. They're all there, the microglia comes along, removes the spine because it doesn't need it. So it's like nipping away and then it transferred down into the soma where it gets destroyed. So this was the first ever video, which was published, I, I think it was 2018, it was. It was the first ever video that actually showed live action of a microglia removing a part of a neuron. So a microglia, a glial cells actively affecting and attacking and removing bits and pieces of a neurons to trying to help it and modulating the excitability. And this was shown in a normal animal. This is not animal with diseases. But again, further studies, especially in Alzheimer's disease, what we found is that when the system is in overdrive because too many plaques are there, the microglia just get confused and they start removing spines and they start removing bits and pieces of the neurons because they just want to get rid of all the extra A beta plaques, plaques that are around. So again, it's going from a normal physiological status or something that would happen normally to go into the overdrive of the disease case. And, and that's pretty much um, what I want to talk about. And the last bit here is just that I, I think it's also important when we talk about the brain and all the different cells that we think about how this simple cells, so the neurons and astrocytes and glia cells in general are interacting to affect the neural network. So affecting the network of cells present within a brain, because at the end of the day, that's what is gonna give us the impact on the behavior. So we go from single cells interactions to the network interaction, to the behavior of our brain and how this is affected. Thank you. I'm gonna stop talking now. Angela, thank you a lot. It was very, very interesting. You're very welcome. I hope it uh, wasn't too much. About calcium distribution, I thought maybe it's connected with what you said earlier, that uh, too high level of calcium is dangerous for neurons. Yes, that's why, like, I think, <laughs> so I imagine that um, astrocytes, they distribute this, like, dangerous calcium, yeah? Uh, so it's not the aim but it's like the result of this uh, um, calcium distribution that uh, many neurons are activated yeah like yeah it could it could be and also it's it's, it's been shown and, and what we're sort of trying to and what they're trying to understand is that it seems to be that even when there is very low activity as you saw earlier with the wake and sleep animal even with this low activity of of, of neurons interacting, this wave of, of astrocyte activation is present. And it seems to be that it's like a background wave of calcium that is happening. And when even more and more cells are brought in, then the wave increases and the calcium level increases. But yes, it could be that the, I mean, we definitely know the astrocytes are way better at handling calcium than, than neurons. I mean, with neurons, we're talking about nano to micro a molar concentration of, of calcium. With astrocytes, sometimes we can go to the high micro and close to millimolar concentration because they've got very different system in dealing with the amount of calcium. I mean, if, if you were to get to millimolar concentration of calcium in your neurons, it means that everything is, is, is dying. So it means that there is some problem, you're having a stroke or something is happening. That's the only time you will get to millimolar. So it could be, it could well be. Uh, but but why calcium is so dangerous for neurons? Because the majority of um, receptors and, and uh, channels present on neurons rely on calcium because calcium is needed for a normal function of proteins. But when there is too much of it, there are some other pathways that are activated. And these are the, pathway, the pathways of cell destruction. It's pretty much an activation that says there is too much calcium, calcium in here. There shouldn't be this calcium. 
something is wrong, you need to die. I think it's a way for the system to regulate itself and make sure the cells that aren't crazy, if you want to call them that way, or the cells that have some problems, don't survive, but they are destroyed. In a, in a way, it's similar with cancer, right? So cells have ways to actually mm -hmm. uh, present that they've been, or they're just getting into the cancer level, so the new system can intervene and destroy them. And, and we think that the calcium is similar in that sense for neurons. When it's too much of it, then they just die because there are some pathways that are activated. They, they can't process such high level of calcium. No, yeah. they literally, when it happens, the whole cell stops because the the sort of uh, pathways of self-destruction starts and the cells just die. Yeah, thank you. I also wanted to ask about spines, this removing of spines, yeah? yeah. Because um, I, I am not sure if I correctly understand what is spine. For me, it's like the synapse, yeah? Presyna yeah. A, a part of presynaptic cell, a part of postsynaptic. Uh, and I can't imagine what happens uh, next to this spine after it had so, been removed. So <laughs> can it be used uh, somewhere in the other place? Well, I mean, it, it might be recycled. These are proteins that probably get destroyed and, and the amino acid used for something else. I mean, that's possible. But what it is pretty much, so imagine that, you know how we always talk about the pre and post synaptic, right? So the interaction of these two is literally your membrane of one cell coming out and the other cell coming out. They then interact. If the interaction is stable enough, the spines are formed, okay? You've got the two spines of the two neurons. Now, normally, in a normal situation, even before microglia were found to remove this, neurons themselves keep adding and removing spines. Because if you have the inter this interaction and you have a strong memory, these two spines will carry on interacting for as long as you stay alive. But if for some reason you don't need this interaction anymore, then these spines are removed and they get back into the system. Now, what microglia seems to be doing, seems to be helping neurons for this, is an extra level of saying, okay, you don't really need this anymore because I haven't felt any interaction between two for a while. So I'm gonna remove this part here so you don't have to do that one. But it's still early days. As I said, that was like four years ago. That was the first time that we actually found and saw in action this sort of presence. So we're still not 100% sure why there also be another system on top of homeostasis to actually interact and remove spines from neurons. Yeah, but it's really very interesting. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's amazing because they said, I mean, homeostasis, again, this is something very interesting. It's something you can spend talking about it for hours because it's the whole basis of literally uh, long-term potentiation and depression. So when we talk about memory formation, because as I said, imagine a memory of you having to remember the name of your parents, okay? That memory is gonna be formed and it's gonna stay with you as long as you can or as long as you're alive. Something like a memory of what you have or what present you got when you were four years old, it was probably very strong when that happened for the first week, but now you don't have to worry about that anymore. So the strong connection that was formed back then had to be removed because, you know, even though I said there are between 100 to 1000 trillion synapses in the brain, there is a limit. And for us to be able to reduce the limit or reach the capacity of our brain, we have to remove the information or we have to remove the memory that aren't actually important to us. And this removal can only happen between the spines because literally the memory formation is down to the spines interacting. It, it, it's very interesting what you said about the limit. Is this question like uh, really being researched? Because uh, it is interesting what is limited like resources are limited yeah. yes calcium um, natrium uh, are limited and they are not enough to form uh, much more connections or what is actually limited uh, they've done some research and study the limitation is the size of the cell because the membrane can only come out to form a spine until a certain point after the limit of that, you cannot actually have any more. But no, there hasn't been done much research because you can imagine it's very difficult to actually try and to drive a system to the limit. Uh, the only thing that we know is that when there are diseases, that's, that's when we can see a bit more limitation of the system. If you have Alzheimer's disease, the limitation on the opposite, because in that case, we actually cannot retain any formation anymore. So what you're actually losing is the formation of the spine. Or well, the spine might be formed for a short-term memory, but they're not kept long-term and therefore that's the limitation of the system. But some people argue that astrocytes and microglia 
are what allows or what allow our brains to not have a limit. That's what some people are sort of claiming that the glia cells allow us to actually have a bit more freedom and a bit more flexibility around things that we can remember or not. Mm -hmm. But maybe even if it's not about limit, anyway, if some um, synapse is not being used, yeah, like it's not optimal uh, to keep it. Yeah, so absolutely. maybe it has to be processed to something what is needed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I also wanted to ask you uh, if yeah. you know something about evolution of different kinds of uh, uh, glia cells. Yeah, like uh, there are uh, several types. And yeah. is it uh, uh, studied whether they developed from some one type of uh, cell or like evolutionary in many species? Yeah. And uh, which species do have uh, uh, glial cells, uh, only mammals, yeah, or also mammals other types? One, so mammals is the one that have the most variety in different types. And um, there has been some sort of similar, but not called astrocytes or glia, but different in drosophila. I know some studies have shown, but it seems to be something that is just down to uh, mammals. And the idea, again, not much has been studied here. Now, microglia are also known as the immune system response in the brain because we as you know we've got the blood brain barrier so the immune system cannot enter the brain unless of course there is some serious problems so microglia are the sentinels in there and checking and making sure that everything is going okay now one of the argument one of the, the hypotheses is that at some point in evolution some immune system cells managed to actually get into the brain or into the, 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 the sort of the, the, the central nervous system and then stay there and developed into these different cells because we, we really don't understand why we've got these different types of cells that do these different things in the brain and not in other brain, in other, um, but you know, another part of the bodies because we do know as well that there are other glial cells not just um, shown cells, for instance, in the penis, in the, in the peripheral nervous system. And some studies that are happening, but are still very early days, are even showing that some of these cells can have an impact on how heart is the, how our heart is modulated. So there is a lot out there that because they said for the last, you know, it's, it's mainly been for the last 30 to 40 years that we've realized the importance of these cells. So I reckon that in the next 20 years, we're gonna have lots and lots of studies coming through. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Maybe somebody else has questions. Oh. I got one uh, probably basic question, uh, but it's interesting for me. So what uh, makes these two parts of the synapses uh, stay together, actually? Why they are staying together? So yeah. um, I understand they have um, uh, some, well, probably you will explain better. So, so once you, normally when you have a pre and post synaptic, you always have proteins, they're known as transmembrane proteins that comes out from the presynaptic and the post synaptic and they interact with each other. Okay. So that's normally the first step when they just sort of first step, get it to know each other. If there is, so everything is down to the activation of the NMDA receptors. So if the NMDA receptors are activated, which means the memory is, the memory is formed, then the system is strengthen even more. So you have more transmembrane proteins coming in, other, other receptors coming in, the astrocytes come in. And once all of that is in place, then you've got this stable activity there. But even the shape and the type of spines that you have or synapses is down to the amount of receptors that you have. Because normally when you start, you might have synapses that are known as silent because they only have AMPA receptors. So they don't have any NMD receptors, which means they can detect glutamate coming in, but they cannot really have any sort of implication in memory formation. But if you start having some gluten coming in, then the cell is like, okay, something is coming that way. Let me put an NDA receptor there. And then step-by-step, step, they actually become uh, stable. But what it is, they're just transmembrane proteins that just kept them together, like sort of a, of a hook, if you, if you know what I mean, just a hook like that. Mm. So um, the role of astrocytes in the... Um, in the strengthening of memory is uh, that they cover, but not uh, physically, more chemically, and they release more serine in the uh, in this uh, cleft, right? So it's 
this is the to sum up this is what they do or they do something else they can also so that they they can also release that was just one example but they can also release glutamate they can also release lots of other atp so lots of other neurotransmitters that have been shown over the years so literally in the last 20 years it, that is to of, increase the signal but it's yes. not to strengthen the uh, the joining but you can well if you if you increase the signal you strengthen the signal as well because if you have more glutamate coming in and therefore you have more NMDA receptors activation postsynaptically and AMP and all the rest you actually okay. strengthen it. But remember, as I said earlier, and that's the important thing as well, is that because homeostasis you have a limit. So there is a limit that if the signal becomes too strong, then the cell has to do something to retrain the signal because you don't want to go into overdrive, right? Uh, so no. then. The, the recalling back could be by reducing the amount of NMDA receptors that you have present on your on your spines mm -hmm. and things like that. Okay. Um, how how you just uh, technical question, but also interesting for me. So you showed uh, uh, some video and pictures where you you or some someone else uh, have visualized the astrocyte specifically. So how did how how you do that? Well, to yeah. Specifically, astrocytes or microglia, is it possible to differentiate them? Yes, yes. So all, all different um, cells, they, they, they express different types of proteins. And what you do, you just use pretty much antibodies with specific fluorophores. So they're antibodies that are linked to something that has got okay. an emission of blue or different lights. And then you can label them and then use microscopes to actually look at them. Mm, okay. Another question is um, this synaptic pruning that is well <laughs> it's what we've been what we studied in our uh, course of neurophysiology so um it happens in first uh, years of well of the of the human being right so when the child is born he has yep. uh, after a while he has lots of uh, connections lots of senses but after pruning is happening so is there any uh, any evidence? Why do we need that, and why this pruning happens? Um, so, for the early, so the video there that was shown actually was done in an adult mouse. So that's something that we consider more like me, I guess, because I'm definitely older, or, or sort of older people than than not actually young, young. But it's true, you're correct, Valerie. So, imagine that. Imagine you've got this system, which is the brain. So the brain is early days or early life you need to learn as much as you can because your survival depends on you learning as much as you can. So during the early years of your life, your brain is in overdrive. That's the, that's the reason why the majority of us, unless it's something very traumatic, you cannot remember perhaps the first three to four years of your life because there's just so much happening that your brain is constantly getting in. And these, to go back to the homeostasis, you form lots of these spines, lots of this memory, but lots of these are pretty much useless because they said it's just the moment is you saying, oh my gosh, I love these new toys. Oh my gosh, I love this new thing. Oh my gosh, look, it's grandma. Oh, let's go for it, go to the park. So things that are not very helpful for you long-term and therefore you've go into the extra or making lots of spines. But then of course the system goes, no, no, this is too much. We don't need all this information. We need to remove this part. And between the cells themselves, the neurons actually getting the spines back into the system with homeostasis and the microglia doing the pruning, that's how the system is actually established. And some of the argument, especially when it comes to um, ADHD or when it comes to even kids having other problems, they think that it's something to do with pruning as a way the pruning doesn't happen as well or as effective as perhaps it should be happening. And therefore the system goes into overdrive and then just struggles to keep up and, and sort of have a normal brain, if you want to go that way. Yeah. But it's uh, from what you said, it's interesting to, to try to reduce this pruning and in, increase the number of uh, connections in the brain so that we can Afterwards, we can, I don't know, learn better, learn more, uh, be more effective. So, but I'm not sure whether more spines equal more effective um, or more brain, right? Because it's a bit like, I think it's, it's, let's think about from the point of view of computer, right? If you have a computer with 100 and terabyte of memory, but you have, you're using up 95 terabyte of that memory, 
the computer will be slower than a computer that has 100 terabyte of memory, but only has 50 terabyte on it. Okay. So I think that the, the system, I agree with you, it would be great. And there are people who are trying to see if they can push it, especially in animals, to see what happens. But I think that the, the idea of why homostasis is there is because when it gets too much, it goes into overdrive and then you just lose uh -huh. it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and probably the last one. Uh, so... Um, is it correct that astrocytes and microglia, they have like the opposite uh, effect on neurons, right? So astrocytes try to protect the synapses, microglia try to destroy what is not uh, important uh, anymore. Yeah, so there hasn't, we haven't found any evidence that microglia do anything to be strengthening synapses. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's the case. I mean, astrocytes can, reduce the interaction between spines, but they don't actually remove the spine. So the, the removal part is only done by microglia. Oh, but they remember, can reduce as well. well, yeah, because it's, it's down to the homostasis, right? So if you release okay. certain so, ah, okay. Okay. yeah. So depending on what they release, depending on that, then you actually have different impact, yes. Okay. Guys, may, may I share a, a little bit what I think about this pruning? Yeah, uh, I, I, as I think, you may correct me, of course, that it's not a problem to a person to form new synapses. It's never a problem. If you start doing some activity, you will form this synapses, yeah? So there is no limit to form new synapses. Maybe what we have limited is our like time, physical possibility to practice all the activities which we can at once, yeah? Like to, uh, in order our synapses to stay fit, they have to be uh, supported, like activated all the time. And we just don't have uh, this time to activate all all of them at once and that's why they have to die and that's why maybe we uh, it would wouldn't be helpful to uh, get rid of uh, pruning because we just don't have so much time to uh, support all these uh, synapses no exactly so it's a lot yeah it's it's a lot to it's these are all fascinating questions and i think there are lots of lots of neuroscientists have been really trying to find some of the answers because as, as we were saying, the fact that we've got all this excessive formation of spines and synapses in the early years, I mean, that's what we sort of came up with is because of new memory and because of, of us learning new things, but we actually are not. And also it's like how, how they change throughout the year and how they change in a way that, you know, once we get old. I mean, one of the arguments is that neurons need to have a system of creating and destroying or removing synapses because they cannot be regenerated. You know, we are born with a set amount of neurons and we're pretty much dying with the same amount of neurons unless something major happens. So because of that, the only way for these neurons to be able to live for 80 years, if you are 80, is to be able to, in, to have these spines coming and going. Uh, Angela, but is it right that the neurons in the peripheral neural system can be regenerated? Absolutely. And also the reality is, again, the dogma of, of neuroscience, the reality is that we know now, and that's probably something that has came along in the last 20 or 30 years, there are pockets in our brain where you can find neuronal stem cells. So you do find some stem cells that can generate new neurons. Cool. Why, we have it, why we have it, no idea. So another project that I was working on, um, it was looking at this, this thing. So both in the hippocampus and the amygdala. So the hippocampus is very important for memory formation. And the amyg amygdala is very important for fear memory formation. So the sort of emotional brain is also known as. These are two parts of our brains where we can find pockets of these stem cells. And the stem cells going back to what we're talking tonight, tonight happen to be in the early stages, astrocytes or more glia cells that then differentiate into neurons. So it's all this sort of new world that we're trying to understand what's happening. Why do we have just two pockets in our brain where we, found, we find the stem cells? What are they doing? Why are they there? Yeah, I uh, hear this for the first time. It's very interesting, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Angela, thank you a lot. It's really a great pleasure that we had this meeting. <laughs> yes, it's been amazing. So anytime, you know where to find me. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we uh, once find some other topic to which we could uh, speak, it would be great. Uh, but but maybe in spring because now we have uh, a lot of problems with electricity and internet, and we hope that in spring <laughs> it will be better already. Thank you a lot for for, for this lecture. Oh, you're very welcome. Anytime, honestly, just as you said, just let's keep the uh, conversation going moving forward. And if I can help, I'll be more than happy to help. Cool. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Angelo. Very welcome. Thank you.